Uh, so hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to introduce Professor Josh Blackman of the Houston College of Law. Professor Blackman is the author of the critically acclaimed Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, and Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. For sale on Amazon now. Right. Okay. Professor Blackman was selected by Forbes for the 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy. He has twice testifi testified for the House Judiciary Committee. He's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Professor Blackman received his BS from Penn State and his JD from George Mason. He later clerked for Judge Kim R. Gibson, U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania, and Judge Danny Boggs, Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Commenting on Professor Blackman's talk will be our own Kristen Underhill, an associate professor of law here at CLS. She received an AB from Harvard and a JD from Yale Law School. Her areas of focus are health law, law and behavior, torts, and insurance. Please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Most of you are for the Pad Thai, but hopefully you enjoy the book as well. Um, my goal for today is to talk about my new book, Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power from Cambridge University Press. And at a high level, the book talks about three Supreme Court cases, Hobby Lobby, King v. Burwell, and the Little Sisters of the Poor case. But it's much more than that. My goal is to tell the story of the Affordable Care Act from 2013 till the present. My first book was called Unprecedented. I spoke about it about four years ago, and none of you were even in law school yet, uh, but it discussed the NFIB v. Sibelius case. This book talks about the next wave of challenges. So to start our story, we actually have to go a little bit further back in time to a time when probably none of you were alive, which was the early 1990s. For any of you may recall, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton and her husband attempted to reform health care with something called the Health Security Act. Uh, this would have been more or less a national health care system where basically all Americans would have had access to a government-provided health care plan. This plan, though, didn't go very far because of a series of commercials. Now, does anyone in this room, all these young millennials, know what these commercials are? Anyone? Okay, my, my colleague uh, is shaking her head. These were a series of commercials known as the Harry and Louise commercials. And the back before there was internet or Twitter, you had TV. Um, and you put these commercials on TV, we had a husband and wife reading the Health Security Act saying, wow, this thing's really complicated, right? I like my doctor. I want to keep my insurance. I don't want the government bureaucrats getting in the way of my health insurance. This was a lesson that was not lost. Because of this fear of people losing their policies, the law went down in flames. Hillary Care never made it forward. The reason why is that there was a paradox of health insurance. And what do I mean by a paradox? Before the ACA was enacted, roughly 85% of Americans were happy with the health insurance they had, 85%. At the same time, about 70% of Americans wanted to improve health insurance for others. So you see the paradox here, right? People were overwhelmingly happy with their own insurance, but they wanted to make it better for the others. You cannot do both. In order to make insurance better for other people, you have to make yours either more expensive or less comprehensive. Right? This is a, a sort of a, a breakdown of insurance. Insurance has to be affordable, comprehensive, and accessible, but it can't be all three. Pick two, as they say. This is why when the ACA was being sold, the Obama administration made a very concerted effort. They wanted to avoid the pitfalls of Hillary Care, right? They wanted to avoid people worrying that they would lose. Whoops, they want to avoid the risk that people would lose their health insurance coverage. And how do they avoid this? With a simple promise. Everyone appears for me. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Thank you, Columbia. Yes. Um, this promise was repeated nearly three dozen times. And it was, frankly, impossible to keep. And it wasn't just impossible to keep uh, uh, because it was a matter of policy, but the Obama administration actually issued regulations making it harder to grandfather plans. Indeed, they made it easier to lose your plan whether you liked it or not. But this promise was essential to assuaging concerns about the validity of the Affordable Care Act and whether people would support it. Okay, So with this promise in place, the bill managed to pass through Congress. Now, you may recall at the time after the 2008 elections, uh, the Democrats had, for a short period, a 60-vote block in the Senate. A 60-vote block. What does that mean? No filibusters. So as long as all the Democrats stayed united, they could pass the, the bill without a single Republican vote. 
and indeed no Republican vote was there. Uh, Republicans made a very concerted effort to oppose this bill at all costs. The president said, you know what? I got the votes. Machiavelli, let's go. Let's do this because we, we can do it right next truth, right? So the Affordable Care Act was a 3,000-page bill, uh, which frankly nobody read. And I'm not saying this facetiously. Uh, Max Baucus, who is the chairman of the Finance Committee, said something like, I didn't read this thing. I paid people to do that for me. Wonderful. So the bill that actually passed the Senate was never meant to be the final version. It was what we might call a test vote, right? Will all the Democratic members line up and support this? It was a draft. There were errors. There were mistakes. It wasn't final. The plan was pass the bill in the Senate, let the House pass their bill, and have a conference committee to go back and forth and you know massage the details of the bill. No conference would ever happen. Why? Because Ted Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, passed away the summer of 2009, and he was the 60th vote in the Senate. And then something remarkable happened. In Massachusetts, a Republican by the name of Scott Brown won a special election to fill Ted Kennedy's seat. With that, the Democrats' 60-vote block was gone. They were down to 59. Had the bill come back to the Senate, it would have been filibuster and killed, and I would not have been able to write two books. I'm one of the few people who's actually profited from the ACA, uh, not by much. So what was the plan? The plan was the House and Speaker Pelosi would pass the Senate bill uh, with only minor modifications. They couldn't make any major changes, and that would be it. So believe it or not, this bill, which scholars such as myself, Professor Unhill of Sutting, was never meant to be the final bill. We're pouring over details of a law that was utterly complete. Why? Because of Scott Brown. And we are stuck with this today. So the bill went to the House. And on March 22nd, 2010, it passed the House on a straight party line vote. I want to draw your attention to something on this chart right there. If I move my thing quickly enough, I can recreate a zero. Not a single Republican. I'll do for your chart, Professor. Uh, there we go. There we go. Zero. Not a single Republican supported this bill. Um, and I want you to remember this chart in your mind whenever you see a debate over the ACA. Uh, the Republicans, for better or worse, made a decision. We don't want nothing to do with this law. So they've had no problem with 50 repeal votes, four Supreme Court cases, and a three-week government shutdown to try and kill the bill. Uh, I think a lot of that stems from this decision to go it alone, no matter. Goes to the White House, the president signs it, because he's all happy, he's like, yeah, I got Obamacare, we're done, this, this thing's over. Not so Fast. Oh, this guy's giving me thumbs down, right? Within nine minutes, nine minutes, count them, nine minutes of the president signing this bill, lawsuits were filed across the country challenging the constitutionality of the ACA's mandates. What was the argument? That government cannot compel individuals to buy health insurance, that the commerce power does not stretch that far. Uh, this was a subject of my first book, Unprecedented. I was here in 2013 talking about it. Maybe some of you remember it. Probably not. The court, right? Can government make you buy insurance? Can they make you buy broccoli? As Justice Scalia noted during oral arguments. What happened? In the first of many cases where the Chief Justice broke my heart, John Roberts voted and says, well, this is not a valid regulation of commerce. It's also not a tax. But, but... To save the bill, for saving construction, I will read the mandate as a tax not having insurance, and thus the ACA was upheld. The chief wrote in his opinion, it is not the job of the court to protect people from the consequences of their own decisions. Uh, he is no fan of the ACA, uh, but for reasons that I'll find out when I read his papers, he decided to uh, switch his vote to uphold it. And that is where we are today. My second book it took less than six minutes to give the background. Good, good timing. After the ACA was upheld, it now fell to the political process to get rid of Obamacare. That failed spectacularly. Why? Mitt Romney, you may recall, was a Republican nominee a couple of years ago. It's, who the hell knows what's today? Do, do we have a Republican nominee today? I don't know if we even have one. Um, he was in debates against President Obama. It did not go well. Why? Because as governor of Massachusetts, he basically created Obamacare. He instituted what's called Romney Care, which was a, uh, uh, an individual mandate requiring people to buy insurance. There were subsidies. The same people who helped build Obamacare, like Jonathan Gruber, helped build Romney Care. 
In fact, during the debate, President Obama said that Romney was the godfather of Obamacare. So in the most serious issue of the election, Republicans picked the worst possible candidate on the issue of health care reform. President Obama won re-election by a large margin. Uh, I would love to know what he and the chief had to say here. It's like, thanks, buddy. Uh, <laughs> but, but again, we'll never know what transpired there. See that smile's like, yeah, whatever. Uh, this brings us now to the second element of the book, which focuses on the contraceptive mandate. Now, when you were following debates over the ACA back in 2009, 2010, the biggest religious liberty issue affected funding of abortion. Now, there's something, there's an amendment to every spending bill going back for decades, which says Congress will not fund abortions, right? They will not spend money on abortions. And there was a fear that the ACA would now provide for funding for abortions. Um, Bart Stupak, who represents a number of pro-life Democrats, these sort of blue dog Democrats, extracted from President Obama an executive order saying that we will not alter um, long-standing prohibitions on abortion funding. Now, for those of you who know anything about common law, an executive order is worthless, right? Why? It can be repealed at any time, and it effectively was. So even though the law was made clear that there'll be no abortion funding, there was a far greater debate about religious liberty that frankly wasn't had. And this was because of Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland, who created something called the Women's Health Amendment, which sounds great. What does the Women's Health Amendment say? Backpacks, right? With respect to women, insurers must provide, quote, preventive care. Care, the statute does not define it. And for those of you who know administrative law, when Congress passes an ambiguous term, what does that mean? They let the agency fill in the blank under the Chevron doctrine, so long as interpretation is reasonable. Indeed, the human resources, uh, the HRSA, interpreted this provision to mean all FDA-approved contraceptives, right? Every single form of FDA-approved contraceptives was covered. That includes everything from the condom to the birth control pill to the morning-after pill and Plan B. But a funny thing happened with this mandate. As drafted by Congress, this provision applied to all employers, all employers, even religious employers. Indeed, the law had absolutely no carve out for conscience. So as the law was scripted, it would have required uh, 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 churches, uh, orders of nuns and everyone else to pay for it. Now, the, the, the recipients of this provision were no doubt happy. This was an actual commercial uh, aired by a Colorado group urging millennials like yourselves to sign up for Obamacare. And I'll read it if you can't. Uh, I gave this talk last night. My dad was in the audience. This was especially, especially pleasant. It says, uh, let's get physical. OMG. That's oh my God for those who don't know. <laughs> OMG, he's hot. My favorite line. Let's hope he's as easy to get as his birth control. Empowering, I suppose. But... The flip side of making sure that this young smiling lady with her thumbs up and he has, yeah, his hands in his pocket is uh, get what they need to get it uh, get it on um, is who's paying for it. And under the original version of this law, it was going to be paid for by a bunch of nuns, right? This is like a, a sound of music casting call. Um, the law, as it was originally crafted, required religious orders of all measure to pay for contraception. I am not talking about Hobby Lobby. I'm not talking about corporations. We're talking about a nonprofit order of nuns who will probably spank me with a yardstick for even reading that word aloud in a public setting. So after some debate, the Obama administration, the Obama administration said, wait, we, okay, this is perhaps a bridge too far. Well, here was, here's what we're going to do, right? If you are a church or your house of worship or if you're some sort of a, uh, uh, you know, an actual worshiping place, you're exempted from the mandate, right? You don't have to be involved with this. Your employees get no coverage. But if you're a religious charity, like the Little Sisters of the Poor, for example, we're not going to exempt you, right? We're going to accommodate you. And there's a difference between an exemption and an accommodation. With an exemption, they're totally kicked out from the, from the, from the project. With an accommodation, what happens? The nuns don't have to pay for it. Instead, they were asked to fill out this form. What's the big deal filling out a form? As a consequence of filling out this form, their insurers, their insurance company, would then provide the contraceptive through their plans. So even though the nuns aren't paying for this coverage, 
it's being used through their plan, or to use a phrase that from the Supreme Court mentioned, hijacking. They're effectively hijacking the little sister's plan to make sure that this girl and her boyfriend can get it on uh, safely, I suppose. So this was the gravamen of the little sisters of the poor case. But the first one to the Supreme Court involved Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby was a for-profit corporation. Okay. I'll get back to Hobby Lobby later, because I want to indulge you in some more political and fun aspects of the ACA, which was during the very contentious time of the summer and fall of 2013. Now, I had assumed, wrongly, that after Mitt Romney was defeated, the battle over Obamacare would end. I thought, oh man, this is over, okay, whatever, we are done. How wrong was I? Uh, my, my junior senator, a federal society member in good standing, Ted Cruz, during the summer of 2013, was on cable news every five minutes saying, we need to defund Obamacare, right? So Cruz realized that, look, we don't have enough votes to repeal Obamacare, but what we can do is block funding to implement the law, and that'll be just as good. So Senator Cruz and his colleague Mike Lee of, of Utah um, had this plan. Follow me here. The budget, what's called the continuing resolution, the budget ended September 30th, 2013, okay? Obamacare opened up October 1st, 2013. So it's perfect, right? Funding ends September 30th. Obamacare opens up October 1st. What happens? Well, we simply don't fund Obamacare and it goes away. So Senator Cruz decided to make this point during a 23-hour speech from the Senate floor. It was not a filibuster. And the reason why this is important to stress, there was a vote scheduled the next day. A filibuster means you talk till you can't talk anymore. Cruz had to sit down at noon the next day. You could not go a minute later than that. So people often say, Ted Cruz's filibuster shut down the government. Uh, it's not accurate. There was a vote. The vote happened, whatever. But indeed, from the Senate floor, he read his children, Green Eggs and Ham, uh, a Dr. Seuss story. And he was there talking for 23 hours about Obamacare. Look at him now. This is towards the beginning. And this is towards the end. See, his tie is loosened. He's, he looks pretty haggard. But Ted Cruz emerged from the uh, uh, filibuster victorious. He felt like he accomplished something. Uh, in the end, he really didn't. Uh, the effect of the Republicans' opposition to funding the government was Barack Obama called their bluff. He said, okay, you guys, you don't want to fund Obamacare? I'm not signing any budget. And it resulted in a, uh, a partial government shutdown. Now, let me go on this point. The government never actually shuts down, right? You still get your mail. People got their Social Security checks. People got their Medicaid funding. Only certain discretionary things shut down. And the most visible sign of the shutdown was the closure of national parks. If I ever got my way, the first thing I would do is amend the law to say that parks stay open in a shutdown. It would be the most effective way of, of rebutting this sort of madness. Because what happened? All these World War II vets went to the memorials in Washington, D.C. And there are these barricades there. So if they storm the beaches of Normandy, they don't get frustrated by these little things. So they took these barricades and literally walked across the street and dropped them at the White House. Brilliant, right? Uh, 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 curiously, the Grand Canyon was also closed, and even Mount Rushmore, which is, you know, a mountain, people closed that off as well. Uh, although somehow the government of New York worked out a deal to pay to open up the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. They, they managed to figure that out. Blue states get a preferential treatment. Grand Canyon stayed closed. But the next big conflict was the debt ceiling. At the same time as the government was shut down and Obamacare was spiraling out of control, we were running into the debt ceiling, right? This is how much money the government could borrow. In the end, the Republicans caved. They funded the government completely. They raised the debt ceiling. They funded Obamacare in its entirety. And oh, by the way, they got rid of the sequestration, which was a series of spending cuts. The shutdown was a disaster. Uh, it did not accomplish anything. And perhaps worst of all, it shielded from public view the launch of healthcare.gov. You see, on the same day, September 30th, that the government went down, healthcare.gov opened. Or actually, it went down also. The website didn't work. It was an absolute disaster. Did anyone actually try using it in this room? Okay, at least one person is actually employed by himself. Right, all of you are in your parents' plans, so yeah, thanks, Obama. Um, so as it, turns, <laughs> as it turns out, the website was an absolute disaster. It was a nightmare. It didn't work. People couldn't register. They were sitting there waiting for hours at a time. Um, there was a Saturday Night Live skit where they joked that on the first day of Obamacare, six people signed up. Um, truth is strange in the fiction. That's actually correct. In the first day, they found six people nationwide who signed up for Obamacare, which is frankly stunning. But send in the nerds. 
Uh, we have the text surge that came in, and uh, uh, thank you for President Obama. The website turned around. Uh, this was a big deal for a period of time. But the next major controversy arose because of cancellations. Now, I told you before, the president promised us if we like our plans, we can keep our plans. This promise was repeated uh, about 36 times. Turns out that wasn't true. The government released a number of regulations that made it harder to grandfather plans, and people were mailed letters like this saying that because of the new health care law, your plan is being canceled. Um, members of Congress grilled the HHS secretary. Uh, the president's plan, I'm sorry, the president's promise was actually dubbed the lie of the year. I didn't know such a category existed, but apparently that's a thing from play the fact, the lie of the year. How did the president get around this? Pen and phone. So through executive action, he took what's known as the administrative fix. The administrative fix says, okay, you have a plan that's not valid under Obamacare. We're going to look the other way, right? We'll let you keep that plan for one year, and actually turns to be almost three years, until you know the next election. So all these people have plans that would have otherwise been canceled by Obamacare. And I think this is unconstitutional, illegal, but I will talk about that perhaps in Q&A. In any event, I'm up. the focus was on enrolling. You can go to your local Obamacare store. I don't know where this place is, uh, but, but apparently they, they had a nice sign put together. Um, and in the end, uh, 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 and with credit, they managed to turn around about 8 million people who signed up in the first Obamacare open enrollment period. Now, the number is actually less than this. Uh, what we found with Obamacare is that people don't pay their bills. It's amazing what happens when you guarantee coverage to people is that they use coverage, and then they cancel without paying their bills. So the actual number is closer to 7 million, but we'll, we'll still give credit. Okay? Let's pivot back to religious liberty, and let's talk about Hobby Lobby. Many of you studied in con law a case called Employment Division versus Smith, right? This case involved a Native American who lived in Oregon named Al Smith. And for his religious sacrament, he ingested peyote. You guys know what this is? It's, a, uh, it's like a cactus that has hallucinogenic effects. It's a controlled substance, but it's used in a lot of Native American uh, uh, ceremonies and rituals. Um, oddly enough, he was employed as a drug counselor. Okay, unsurprisingly, he lost his job uh, uh, for using controlled substances. He went to apply for unemployment benefits from the state of Oregon. And the state said, we are not giving you money. Why? You were terminated for breaking the law. You were terminated for using a, a illegal drug. Went to the Supreme Court. In a very controversial decision by Justice Scalia, the court held that this was fine, that the law was generally applicable. That is, everyone was prohibited from doing drugs. We weren't singling out Native Americans and not this group or that group. As a result, the state could deny coverage to Mr. Smith. About two years later, Congress said, we have other ideas. And they passed what's known as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, if you want to be cool. Uh, it was remarkable, signed into law by Bill Clinton. You have Chuck Schumer on one shoulder, Orrin Hatch on the other. Uh, the idea of passing a such momentous bill about religious liberty, uh, which seems unfathomable today, happened so quickly two decades ago. And what does RIFRA do? It says very simply, if the government wants to substantially burden your religion, they have to do so in the most narrowly tailored way possible, right? They can't. They can't just cite this general applicability thing. They have to be very, very uh, discreet with how they protect your religious rights. One of the first cases that tested RIFRA was involving a church in uh, Texas, not too far from where I live. And the church wanted a zoning permit, saying, we want to expand. And the city said, no, we won't give you a zoning permit because you have a beautiful church. We don't want you to change your facade. Our religious liberty. Went to the Supreme Court. What did the court do? They said RIFRA was unconstitutional. Why? Congress cannot waive a state's sovereign immunity. They cannot allow a state to be sued in this fashion. However, RIFRA still applies to the federal government. Hobby Lobby. Now, has anyone ever actually been to a Hobby Lobby? Are you guys from New York? See, this is why. I'm from Staten Island, and I, I love traveling abroad. Whenever I come back home, I, always, I realize how great it is to live not in New York. No. Uh, get out more. Uh, during, during Justice Sotomayor's confirmation hearing, you can find this. Uh, one of the senators was asking her if she's ever lived outside of you know New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut, and she's saying, "Well, I visited here and I visited." It's like, "No, I've never lived." She's like, "No." Um, so move out, move around. You get you get different things to learn from different parts of the country. That's true. So Hobby Lobby is a craft store. Uh, it was founded by David Green in his garage, and he was making picture frames in his garage and selling them. And the business was very successful. He managed to open up a store in Oklahoma City and eventually open up a nationwide chain. 
But this is not like your McDonald's franchise, okay? The company is basically owned by a husband and wife, David and Barbara Green. And this is not an Easter card. This is a picture of the board of directors. The board of directors of this company are all family members. They all have the same religion. They have the same faith. They have the same beliefs. And one of those beliefs is that certain forms of contraception, not all of them, but four forms of contraception, um, IUDs, uh, these are intrauterine devices, that's your uh, acronym of the day, and uh, the plan B and Ella are sinful. Why? Because they operate after fertilization. And you can, I can draw a picture later what that, what that means. So Hobby Lobby said, we can't be forced to pay for these four things. Birth control pill is fine, but not these forms of uh, contraceptive. Why? It violates our religious liberty. Gosh. How can a corporation have religious liberty? What is like Citizens United for religion? So the, the, the short answer is, we are not under First Amendment here, right? We are under a statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And the word in the RIFRA statute says, religion of a person. So Josh, what are you talking about? Congress defines the word person in the Dictionary Act. Go to the U.S. Code, your library, 1 U.S. Code 1, the very first page of the U.S. Code defines terms. And the word person is defined to include a corporation. So this was not actually a controversial point. In fact, only Justices Ginsburg and uh, Sotomayor dissented on this point. Breyer and Kagan said, yeah, that's, that's probably right. They, they didn't say it outright, but they, they, they didn't join the dissent on that point. Why? I'll give you an example why this is important. Imagine you have a kosher or halal butcher, and the government passes a law saying that you cannot slaughter these animals in the ritual fashion that's necessary. You must use a stun gun to protect uh, against animal cruelty. Okay, Poland passed just such a law. Could that butcher shop then sue that it violates the religious identity that makes them slaughter animals in this, in this uh, un, un, unholy way? I think the answer has to be yes, but under the government's reading, the answer is no. They say, well, maybe the customers of the butcher shop can bring a suit, but they're not the ones the law acts upon. So I think this is, this is not the controversial part. The controversial part is, does it burden the religious liberty to pay for someone else's birth control, right? Is your conscience being damned by paying for someone else to commit sin? We do lots of things. We pay for taxes, for example, that support wars that we may deem sinful, right? We do lots of things that we are giving our money to that we don't like. This was the case, I think, the, 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 the majority of the case that had to go up. Uh, one of the ladies I love discussing cases is by showing signs. Signs are beautiful. These were from a, a demonstrator standing outside the Supreme Court. And I'll give you a sampling of the signs. So this was my favorite one. Um, it says, if men can get pregnant, birth control will be from gumbo machines and be bacon flavored. Um, uh, this is not a church. This is a craft store. And this is not a healthcare plan. Uh, this is my favorite. She dressed up as a birth control pack. Uh, I, thought that, I thought that was very creative. Uh, this sign, hey, Supreme Court, no bosses in my bedroom. Now, this sign, I think, is misguided. Hobby Lobby would agree. We don't want to be in your bedroom. We don't want to pay for your stuff. Go pay for it yourself. So this sign, I think, missed the mark somewhat. It was my business. Hobby Lobby would probably agree with that. Corporations are not people. And my favorite, this woman crocheted a uterus. Um, and I'm almost certain she did not buy the yarn at Hobby Lobby. In fact, there was actually a campaign to send to the Hobby Lobby headquarters crocheted uteruses. Uh, this was an entire thing. I, I don't know if people have time in their hands. Uh, but but, but you know, this is what people do. Uh, we are the 99%. Uh, keep your hobbies off my ovaries. Um, the pro-life signs are never as good. They're, they're never as good. I am pro-life. Yeah, okay. Uh, these guys are my favorite. They were saying they're in a 30-degree weather wearing kilts and bagpipes. Uh, talking about repealing socialist Obamacare because God's law comes first. Again, the signs are not nearly as funny. <laughs> the case was argued by Paul Clement for the challengers and Don Verrilli for the uh, uh, government. Um, the decision came down more or less as we expected. The majority was by Justice Alito, and he held that, number one, corporations can have religious identity. Number two, it substantially burdens their identity to pay for contraceptives. And number three, the government can do this in a less burdensome way. How? Let the government pay for this stuff themselves, right? Why are you making Hobby Lobby pay for it? Let the government pay for it itself. Justice Kennedy had a very important concurring opinion. He said, well, I agree with this, but we should be careful of not imposing too many burdens on the female employees, right? We shouldn't be putting these burdens on these employees. Make sure that they have access to it some other way, but don't make Hobby Lobby pay for it. Uh, the dissent was by our favorite character, uh, the notorious RBG. I think this is actually the case where she went up the rails. I think this is what actually went to her head. Uh, she had this interview with Katie Kirk where she showed her her RBG t-shirt. 
One of the note about Justice Ginsburg, she always wears these little neck doilies, right? These little frills. Um, I actually got in Black's Law Dictionary where neck doily is in there. You're welcome. Um, but if you're ever at the court, this is her majority opinion or her dissenting jabot, as it's called. So if you ever see her wearing this, she wrote an opinion. She wears this one when she has to read something from the bench. Uh, her and Justice Scalia sparred often, although they were good friends. Uh, so after Hobby Lobby, the pro-life generation felt emboldened. This girl, blowing the kisses, is definitely saying the wrong message. Uh, okay. But we move on. The second major case I'll talk about, and I'm right on schedule, uh, is called King v. Burwell. This case involves tax subsidies. So the ACA has something called an exchange. There is a state exchange, for example, you have a New York exchange, and there is a federal exchange, which is the healthcare.gov. So I live in Texas. My state said, screw you, Obama, we're not making an exchange. And so we are now all on the, the federal exchange. Why does this matter? So the ACA says in one provision that all states shall establish an exchange. This can't mean what it says because the government can't require states to do stuff. That's what's called commandeering. So in the event that a state fails to establish an exchange, what happens? The secretary shall establish an exchange in the state's place, right? So that's why we have a healthcare.gov. But where does this all go awry? Section 36B of the ACA says that subsidies are available in exchange that, that was enrolled in, quote, established by the state. Again, subsidies are available for plans enrolled in through an exchange established by the state. So there was a benefits lawyer in South Carolina, a guy named Tom Christina, who actually bothered to read the ACA. I think he was the first person to do so. And he's reading and reading and reading and says, wait a minute, this means you only get subsidies in the state exchange, not the federal exchange. That means the entire federal exchange will be a worthless thing because you can't buy these policies without the subsidies. These plans are too darn expensive. Lawsuits were filed saying that, look, government, you cannot treat the federal exchange and the state exchange equivalently, right? These are different things. The text means what it means, and state means state. The case goes to the Supreme Court. There were a number of plaintiffs filed. One case was filed in the District of Columbia. This is Jacqueline Halbig. Another case was filed in the Fourth Circuit. These are the Hearsts. And a circuit split form. And it goes to the Supreme Court. Again, the signs of conservatives are never very original. IRS meant it's illegal. I didn't like the IRS. Okay, it's not very sexy. But the signs that did resonate well were these. These were signs saying that if the court ruled in favor of the challengers and held that subsidies were not available in states with exchanges, people would lose their coverage. Insurance would become so expensive, for example, in New Jersey, 237,000 people would be unable to afford insurance. I think this argument prevailed on the justices because after arguments, by a six to three vote, the court upheld the payment. And the chief justice in the second decision that broke my heart or continues breaking, it's an ongoing process, I suppose, uh, wrote that the purpose of the ACA is to improve health insurance and not destroy it, and we must read it in that fashion. Justice Scalia, in what would be his last dissent from the bench, wrote, we should stop calling this law the Affordable Care Act and start calling it SCOTUS Care. That is, the Supreme Court applies a different set of rules for the ACA than any other law. But by a vote of six to three, the law was upheld. We move on with perfect pacing to the final case of the day, which is our favorite group, the Little Sisters of the Poor. Uh, I had a moment to actually meet with them. So after their case was argued at the Supreme Court, a uh, lunch was held in their honor, and I, I snagged an invitation. And I, I walk into this room full of nuns. It looks like a casting call for the sound of music. Uh, uh, you know, how do you solve a problem like Scalia, as it were? Uh, uh, but unfortunately, Justice Scalia was not there. By the time the Supreme Court heard the Little Sisters of the Poor's case, uh, Justice Scalia had passed away. So they were down to eight justices. And I was at the court that day. Uh, I love these sketches. These were the nuns sitting at the cafeteria in the Supreme Court uh, having something to drink. Uh, and you walk around the court, and you had these guys in these full white robes and hoods uh, uh, sitting there with, among the justices. It was, some, it was a sight to be seen. Um, but the case was argued, and the overwhelming theme of the case was one of hijacking. They, the idea that the government is hijacking the nuns, and they're taking their plan, and they're using it to provide these sinful products, right? The, the, the nuns said, wait a minute, we have, we have these Obamacare exchanges, right? Why can't women go online and buy a plan on Obamacare and get these free contraceptives from the government? That won't work. Why? 
because it imposes a burden on women and this must be a seamless process. There cannot be any burden on the female employees who are doing this. After the case was argued, the nuns came down the stairs. They did not get into a bus, uh, but they did walk a few blocks away. Uh, I'm saying somewhere in the background of the crowd, if you look carefully, uh, <laughs> and the nuns gave their statement. But then something crazy happened, right? Usually when the case is submitted, we sit and we wait and wait and wait. But three days after it was argued, the chief justice, I'm sorry, the court issues an order saying, uh, we're having some trouble, you guys. We can't quite resolve this. Can you maybe think of some other way that we can get these women contraceptives without burdening religion? Like, can you give us some suggestions? Like, whatever you want, anything you think of, give it to us. This was unprecedented. Um, so the court issued this order, and the parties filed briefs saying, yeah, no, we can't, right? We're, we're very far apart. The government said, you have to have the same plan providing the contraceptives. The, the nun said, we do not want our plan being used in this fashion. So what happened? Nothing. The Supreme Court issued an order about a month later saying, wow, look at this. You guys told us you can make a compromise. They didn't. You told us you can reach a, you know, a deal. They didn't. Go back to the lower courts. Figure this out when we have nine justices. Oh, they didn't actually that last part. But they did remand it to the, to the courts of appeal saying, you guys figure this out. We don't know what to do. We are out of any ideas. Uh, so this was a decision in Zubik v. Burwell. It's currently on remand to the courts of appeals. Um, the nuns took it, though, as a victory. Uh, 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 this is actually Pope Francis went to visit the little sisters when he was here a few months ago. The nuns took it as a victory because they didn't lose. Right? It's always good not to lose, but they also didn't win, and this case is far from over. And the identity of the next justice will make a big deal. I'll give you a preview. Merrick Garland has to be recused from this one. He actually voted in a case in the D.C. Circuit on this issue, so good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> and that brings me to my conclusion with, with exactly three minutes, uh, with actually three seconds left. Um, I don't quite know the future of the ACA, uh, but, but I, what I will say is I think that it's going to be a wild, wild ride. Thank you all so much, and I look forward to your attention.